Let's do this. Here we go. Week number two of our sermon series called Welcome to the Neighborhood, which is all about Jesus coming to this earth and giving us a new way of life. My name is Landon. I'm one of the student pastors here at Woods Edge, and I'm so pumped that y'all are here tonight, that y'all would choose to be here on a Wednesday night. And before I jump into tonight, I have a real quick announcement for us, uh, Freedom Weekend. Anybody? 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 Amen. Aaron, double raised hand. Cool. January 12th through the 14th, there's the QR code, there's the price. Registration closes January 7th, okay? That date, January, that's misspelled. It's okay though, God, God still exists and is good. So that date will be here sooner than you realize. And so my ask is that you may as well sign up as soon as possible because once that date hits, registration closes. Freedom Weekend is gonna be an awesome weekend this year filled with lots of fun, scavenger hunts, a big opener that y'all are not gonna wanna miss. So sign up for Freedom Weekend. It's going to be a blast. I'll talk about that a little bit later in my message. Please take our misspelled graphic off the screen now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cool. Okay. Have you ever, yes, have you ever experienced something so good, so epic, so incredible, so amazing that you had difficulty telling somebody about it? Yep, yep, okay. Two examples for me. Instagram memes. Yes. Yes. When well, I imagine this happens to me all the time. So you're scrolling very quickly, and then you see a meme, and you're like, that's so funny, bro. But then, like, you don't laugh, but it's still funny. Very weird concept there. Um, and then, and then, and then, and then, two days later, you see one of your friends, and you're like, this meme was so funny. So then you go back on your phone and you try to find the meme, but you can't find it. So then you have to try to explain the meme and then you explain the meme so bad and they don't laugh and it's so awkward. Anybody, anybody, amen. That happened to me at community group on Tuesday night. I stood in my kitchen and I scrolled for two minutes, which is an eternity, by the way, because no one else was talking to me. I didn't find the meme. I tried to explain it. No one laughed. And I could only think if you were just there with me when I watched it the first time, we would all be laughing. And instead, they just said, nah, bro, you're good, and dap me up. And it was really, really awkward. Anyway, second example of something that is really cool that's hard to explain. I, that's such the correct answer, but I'm not there yet, okay? Give me a few more minutes to get to Jesus. I'm talking about something else first. Um, so I, I do a, a part of my, um, what's the word, entertainment that I like is, is sports, okay? It's true. I'm sorry. Give me like five minutes here. Cool. So growing up, I was raised an LSU fan, Okay. We're gonna get some hissing probably, that's cool. Um, and so I grew up going to a lot of LSU football games, okay? They play in a stadium called Tiger Stadium, which, Austin, be quiet, bro, which in my opinion has the best night environments in the stadium, okay? I think that a and has a better day-to-day -day game experience, okay? But a night game in Tiger Stadium is absolutely insane. So two years ago now, wait, one year ago in November, me and my dad went to Tiger Stadium to see LSU play Alabama. Both teams were very good. They were ranked in the top 15. So a lot of hype was built up about this game. And as we enter the stadium, there is this vibe that like, if LSU wins, everybody in the stands is gonna run on the field. 
That's kind of the vibe. Like, it's cool, though. I promise it's cool. And so the game's happening. It's so loud. People are yelling. Also, this is the same night that the Astros won the World Series. Crazy enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so the game ends in regulation tied, which means they go to overtime. Really? So Alabama scores, and then LSU scores and decides to go for two. What that means is if they score the touchdown, they win. If they don't score it, they lose. Everybody got it? Cool. So quarterback goes to the right, throws the ball. Mason Taylor catches it, dives into the end zone. Touchdown, LSU wins the game. What happens, right? Everybody starts sprinting towards the field. My dad's next to me. I go, dad, let's go, let's go. He's like, where? I'm like, the field, duh. So after he gets composed, he was, anyway, it's fine. We run towards the field, which wasn't a fast process. All the stairs were clogged, it's fine. So we get down to the field and there is a fence that you have to hop over to get onto the field, okay? Me, being decently athletic, not very hard. My dad, on the other hand, tries to hop this fence, and well, here you go. Uh, pretty funny, pretty cool, but kind of the vibe I'm going for here is, um, one, if you don't care about sports, you're like, what is happening? And two, if you weren't there, you probably still have no idea what happened that night or any of the details of the game or what actually took place. And the truth is, some things in life just can't be explained. I can't do anything to explain to you exactly what happened that night or all the emotions and how the game was like this and went like this, right? Some things in life need to be experienced. If you were there that night, you, we would share that same experience and you would be like, yes, I get it. But I'm pretty sure none of you were there, right? Anybody was there? No. So me explaining it is not going to do what happened that night, justice. And the Christmas season can kind of be that way too, right? We see the atmosphere, the festive feelings that pop up when we see the lights and the tree, the lights, the blow-ups, the weird people that have like the Grinch all over their yard, which is kind of weird because it's like, Either you don't like Christmas or the Grinch is just your favorite Christmas character, even though the Grinch doesn't like Christmas at all. Double negative? I don't know. School is hard. Anyway, um, several of us probably have a preconceived notion of exactly what Christmas is supposed to look like. Your family probably does Christmas a certain way. You go to this person's house on this day. You have this meal. You open up presents at this time. Although I always open presents before Christmas. I don't know why. Um, and in that, it can be really hard to explain to other people how you do Christmas. For me, I have divorced parents, and so like, I go to this house, I go to this house, I drive to Brenham, it gets kind of crazy, and for you, that may be not the case at all. And the truth is, unless you experience how I do Christmas, it's very hard to me explain what happens in the Miller household at Christmas. Some families believe in Jesus, other families don't, which creates a lot of different ways that we can celebrate Christmas, right? For some, it's all about the gifts, and for some, it's all about our Savior. And for us, it's all about what John says in chapter one of his book in verse 14 that we read last week. It says this, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, generous, inside and out, true from start to finish. The NIV says this, same verse, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. 
We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, it may not seem like it, but this verse is describing the very first Christmas. When Jesus joined us here on this earth in the word becoming flesh and blood. Jesus, Emmanuel, coming to us, God with us. Unfortunately, many of us will have encounters or experiences in our lives that make Christmas a very difficult time. Sometimes life is so difficult and we go through such tough circumstances, it can be hard to think that it even matters that God's word became flesh and blood. It doesn't feel like that move from heaven to earth makes a bit of difference in our lives because sometimes life can be really, really hard. And in those moments, it's easy to think that the good news of Christmas, that God came to be with us, might not be that good after all. Because the circumstances of our lives drown out the truth that God has for us. Because for some of us in this room, the holiday season doesn't bring joy or happiness. It can be painful. I mean, if you've lost someone you love, maybe you think of them more during this time, and all you can feel is that pain. And so tonight, we're going to dig into that. And God's truth that he wants to be with us and walk with us. That God wants us to experience his love. He wants us to experience his son, Jesus. So that's what tonight's going to be all about. Let's pray. God, as we open your word tonight, we just want to thank you for your son. Thank you that you would humble yourself into the form of a baby and that, God, that's who we get to worship. God, you're so humble, you're so meek and lowly, and you chose to come to earth like that. And so, God, tonight, would it continue to build in this room that you were You want us to experience you. You want us to walk with you. You want us to experience your love. So God, would you be with us tonight? Amen. So no matter what you've heard about Christmas before, or whether you care or not, or whether you believe or not, I'm asking you for the next few minutes to rethink all of it. Rethink all of it. Imagine that this is the first time you've ever heard of the story of Jesus coming to this earth. Here's why. The Christmas story isn't just a story, it's actually history. And it starts like this. In Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, and it says this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to their own town to to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So if you look this census up that Caesar Augustus issued, okay, It's a real thing. It's a real census. It is actually historically accurate. And so because of this, we can accurately pinpoint the birthing time frame of Jesus, our Savior. Jesus actually came to this earth as a baby. 
Now, we kind of talked about this last week, but I want to ask you this question right now. Um, If you were the God of the universe and you wanted to show up on earth and announce your presence, how would you do it? I imagine some of you may want to rappel down from heaven. Some of you may want to fly down like Superman. Some of you want to be super ominous like Batman and be in the shadows and be like, I am the shadows. Something weird like that, right? I I, I could imagine that. Um, But when the God of the universe actually arrived, he chose to show up as a baby. Small, helpless, and completely dependent on others for survival. And what's funny about this is that for almost all of human history, people thought of God as distant, angry, someone that they needed to appease to get his approval. But then God actually showed up in our world as an infant to show humility and kindness. God showed up in the world the same way you and I did, as a baby. And so that should do a few things in your brain right now. If you ever wonder if God knows you, if God loves you, if you ever wonder if God understands you or knows what it's like to live on this planet, he does. He knows. He knows and has lived through a human life in the flesh. He knows the feelings you get. He knows the temptation you deal with. The creator of the universe has been in your shoes. He's been tempted by Satan. He's walked on this earth. He gets the feelings that you and I experience. He gets it. And that's the God that we worship. That's the God that we just worshiped. A God that loves you, that created you, and understands you more than you will ever know. And as we continue in this Christmas story, we see that God wanted to share this. He wanted to share that, hey, I'm here. My son is here. The Messiah has come. But he did not go and grab the people that you may expect. We see this again in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. And we go and visit some shepherds. It says this, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. You see, in that neighborhood and in the surrounding communities, the shepherds were at the lowest status. They were too poor, too unclean, and too undignified for regular society. And this shows us something spectacular about God's character. When God showed up to this earth, everyone was invited. Everyone was invited. The angels brought with them good news of great joy. And by showing up in that neighborhood and making this announcement to a group of shepherds outside the walls of the city, God could not have made the point any clearer. God's love is for all people at all times in all places. He didn't go and grab Caesar or some high government official in this town. He went and grabbed the shepherds and said, come on, 
The Messiah is here. So for us in this room, that should challenge us. That should challenge us. Men, when we're out, when we're sharing our faith, do we have tunnel vision? Are we only going to go to certain people? Are we going to exclude others? Because God didn't. He said, I'm going to go to these people that are poor, unclean, undignified. And I'm going to go, my son's here. Come check it out. When God came to this earth, everyone was invited. Everyone. So be careful who you close your heart off to because Jesus still loves them. Jesus still loves them. I'll say it again. God's love is for all people at all times and in all places because he's just that good. And his love transcends any idea that we could ever have of love. It's for all people in all places. And what we should really focus in on in this story is that the shepherds weren't just satisfied with hearing about what the angels had to say. In Luke 2, 16 through 20, Luke writes, So the shepherds hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And so for you in this room, when you hear this story, you're probably curious, skeptical, or certain that this baby is your savior and your king. But I know for everyone in this room, we have to follow the shepherd's example. Because Jesus is meant to be experienced, not just explained. Jesus is meant to be experienced. He's meant to be walked with, not held out at a distance. He is meant to know all of you and yet still love you. Man, as I opened up service tonight, I don't want you to walk in this room anymore and just hear a sermon. When we walk into this room, I want us to experience the love of Jesus. I want these words that I'm reading from Luke to come alive to you in your head going, this is my king. This is God with us. That he would come to earth, humble himself to the form of a baby. I want to experience that. I don't want that to just be explained to me over and over again. I don't want to hear this Christmas story over and over and over again, and it's just more exposition in my head. I want to experience Jesus. And so how do we do that? Four ways. Ready? Here we go. One, you keep showing up. Keep showing up. Wednesday, Sunday, small groups, serving. The more we're around worship, the more we're in our word, the more that we're around biblical community, I mean, I promise you, you will experience the love of Jesus. Because when we're here, when we're worshiping, we're in our word, it will overflow from your heart. Man, the love of Jesus is different. It will change your life. And when you're operating out of an overflow from being filled up, just watch. Just watch how stuff around you starts to change. Not that it gets easier, but that it starts to change. Two, hey, ask a question. Ask a question. Man, this is what I believe. Why do I believe that? Man, this story is good. Why did he come as a baby? Then when we're in this space, asking a question shows your heart and your brain that you care and that you want to learn more. So get in the habit of asking questions because that's how we're going to learn more and more about our Savior. Third thing, take the experience with you. 
right? If you felt the love of Jesus during worship tonight, don't just leave that love here, take it home. What's stopping you from going home tonight and worshiping your house tomorrow morning, tomorrow night? If you hear a good word tonight, what's stopping you from going home and getting into Luke and reading it all, right? Take the experience with you. Fourth thing, hear me out, hear me out. Come to Freedom Weekend. Hear me out. It's going to be fun. Yes. It's going to be crazy. Yes. The number one reason why we don't experience Jesus is because we're too busy. Because we're too distracted. What makes Freedom Weekend different is not anything we do. No lights or show or song or dance, but because at Freedom Weekend, we eliminate distractions. And the focus is Jesus. And it's crazy what happens when we throw away all this stuff that doesn't matter and spotlight on the one thing that does. So I'm telling you, if right now it's hard and you're like, man, I wanna experience Jesus, but there's so much going on in my life, show up to Freedom Weekend. And I promise you, you will experience Jesus. Two reasons why. One, because he's just that good. And two, because there's no distractions. And you can focus on your Savior. Guys, I, I want you. I need you. I plead you. We have to experience Jesus. This isn't a class at school. This isn't some religious game that we're all playing to see who's better. This is a God who came to this earth and has walked in the same shoes as you, who's lived on this earth, who wants to know you, who does know you and all your mistakes that you will ever make. And he still chooses to love you. He still chooses to love you. What's crazy about the story of Jesus is the birth of Jesus is only the beginning of the story. It's only the beginning. And as he walked this earth and lived the perfect life and performed miracles, what makes it so beautiful is that he came with a purpose. He came with a purpose. He came because the wages of our sin is death. It's death. And without Jesus, we would have been eternally separated from God in heaven. But because Jesus came with a purpose, to love us and to die for us, that's what makes this story so powerful. That's what makes this word so true. Because he came to this earth with a purpose to die for you and for me. It is by the blood of Jesus that we are set free. That we no longer have to stay in the shame and guilt of our sin. It's all through 